The following program is a production of The Bob and John Show. Any similarity between person and places is strictly a coincidence. The producers of this program are solely responsible for its content. It's now time for the Sudsy Wudsy Show, brought to you by Sudsy Wudsy. Sudsy Wudsy, it's an all-purpose cleaner. It's a car wash. It's a bubble bath. Yes, it's Sudsy Wudsy. Sudsy Wudsy now proudly presents the adventures of Jimmy Ballpoint, private investigator, ear, eyes, and nose, the complete package. Jimmy Ballpoint. This is where I work, the city. It used to be a nice place with nice people. But like everything else, they left. And now the city is a dark and gritty city with dark and gritty sidewalks, with dark and gritty taxis, downright depressing if it wasn't for the gum stuck under the tables at the automat. I'm Jimmy Ballpoint, private investigator, ear, eye, and nose, the complete package. My office is up three flights of stairs, straight up, right above a flop house. A little office with a desk, chair, sink, and a couch. Like I said, a dark and gray place, but it's just right for a guy like me. The case that I'm working on now is the case of Two Fingers Tommy. Every day on my way to Angel's Bar, I pass a shoeshine stand of Two Fingers Tommy. A nice guy, not a mean ball in his body. He has this kind of smile that kind of grows on a mug. Not much into conversations until someone starts one. Then the guy's like a phonograph needle. Kind of unusual, the story behind this little guy. Not much to look at, not a dresser. Same clothes, day in and day out. I was told that he came from a family with dough. The kind of people that usually run things, buy things, use things, all kinds of things. Hmm. He never impressed me as being like that. He came from an Ivy League school in Upper State. Smart kid, so everyone says. To listen to the guy, you couldn't prove it by me. But forgetting all that, Two Fingers did know the streets. He knew the comings and goings of everyone and everything. Come to think of it, being on the main road of life around here, right next to Angel's Bar, can give a mug an education not found in the books. Take shoes, for instance. Two fingers could tell a lot about a hack just by looking at his shoes. He knew what beat cops had just by looking at their footgear. A badge on the Upper East Side had clean shoes. The heels wore evenly, and the sides and tops were soft and easy to buff out. Comes from sitting a lot in a squad car, taking breaks in a sidewalk cafe, and rarely hooping it in the winter. The guys elsewhere didn't have it so good. The stuff that 
wore down the soles came in every shape and size. Glass, street jazz, doing alleys, kicking doors in, stuff like that. The cops on the south side usually had red brick marks on the soles from resting against a wall and raising a knee. Resting the shoe against a wall will do that. The cops that were constantly moving had a habit of taking their baton and hitting the side of their shoe with it after resting for a while, then starting the beat again. Tommy once told me that most of the faces in the city were pretty easy to deal with, so he'd say. <laughs> yeah, and stuff like that. But the faces in the skyscrapers, the penthouse stiffs, the stick pins, they were another story. Bumping up, that footgear always seemed to want more than most. One piece of work wanted his shoelaces taken out before two fingers applied polish. Said it got on the fingers of his butler when he tried to tie the shoes for the mug. <laughs> Can you beat that? Thinking of his butler. What a swell work of art. I asked the little guy if he had any problems with the ladies. He told me that he doesn't do that crowd. The stand ain't built for the ladies. A little too much information there, if you know what he meant. I asked him, how about the tips, you know, grocery dough? The regular faces around here, guys like me, Angel, Wrinkles, Captain Finn and others, were decent, nice tippers, along with conversation that went well. The upper crust, well, they go their way and he goes his. Two fingers looks up, his face frowns a bit and says, looks like we'll be getting a good downpour this afternoon. I look up and saw clear blue, plenty of sun, not a cloud in sight. Across the street was the newsstand, all covered up. Hmm. Two Fingers has a pretty good batting average about this stuff. Maybe I should head back to the office and get my slicker. Huh. Yeah, what are the chances? I head into Angel's bar and claim a stool. No sooner than I cover the stool, the door opens, letting in the street air. The smell of the sewer and trolley noises followed. The door closes in its two fingers. He looks back and forth, tries to adjust his eyes to the dim lighting. He spots me. He walks over and asks if he could take up some of my time. I nod to the stool next to me. He climbs up. Before he starts, my curiosity gets the best of me and I ask him, how did you get the name Two Fingers? Seems odd. He says, not really. Most of your better shoe blacks use only two fingers to apply layer after layer. The good ones, anyway. The first layer is for the base, then brush off. The second is for the shine, the buff, you know. Two fingers gets the details, all of them. So any shoe black worth his salt is a member of the two finger fraternity. That may be strange to some, but it's a living. Hmm, I didn't know that. Okay, okay, I said. What's your business with me? Two fingers looks back and forth, then behind him. Leans forward to me, kind of close. I lean back, then whisper, this ain't going to be flowers and dinner, is it? He looks confused, staring at the bottles across the bar, like he forgot where he was going. 
I broke his stare and said to him, you were saying. He looked at me with that, oh yeah, look. He told me that another shoe black was setting up shop on the other side of Angel's Bar, a slick looking place with cushioned seats, shaded overhang, armrests, and a built-in ashtray, stuff like that. I turned away from two fingers and shrugged my shoulders and told him, that's progress, gotta go with the flow, Tommy. He kept his eyes glued on me and said, that's not the trick. This is a new hack, and he's shaking me down for five skins a week. Hmm. I smell muscle. Big time. Muscle. I motion Angel for a shot of Tattletail. One tilt of the head back from one of those shots and you'll be yakking all day. What the heck? Might as well. I talk to myself a lot anyway. At least I'm guaranteed to get the last word in. I told Two Fingers that I'd look into it. No promises, mind you, but I'd look into it. I stopped yakking long enough for the shot of Tattletail to wear off. Made it outside to the street and stood next to the taxi stand. Hmm. There's only one man that can answer my questions. The man of men in this city. The answer that's final. Little in the way of conversations. But the end of, we don't have a conversation here. Get out. And that man was Old Man Pierogi. I walked over to the taxi stand, not that far from Two Finger Tommy's shoe shine. I could have done better today with my time, but I figured it's good to pay a visit to Old Man Pierogi sometimes. Shows respect. Old Man Pierogi is real big on the respect stuff. Men of his generation have a deep sense of what respect is all about in their world. It's easy for muscle to make it in that business, real easy. But with muscle comes a lot of laundry and dry cleaning, along with bad feelings and a constant worry of who's waiting in the tall grass kind of thing. Old Man Pierogi was a tough guy in his day, but a smart, tough guy. He wasn't so much what he did, it was what he could do. Coming up around a crowd like that takes smarts. Old Man Pierogi was very smart. I knew that and I respected his place in that pecking order of things. A real respect. I think he knew that. We rarely spoke to one another. That's just the way it is. Any talk, he told me, not the other way around. Besides, his social secretary is wrinkles. Need I say more? But today, I'm feeling pretty good, confident even, a good thing if I'm going to ask for time with Old Man Pierogi. A taxi pulls up and I open the back door and get in when I freeze. It's Danny Morbid. Oh, great. This is just beachy. I get in and sit back. I look out my window and Two Fingers Tommy gives me the thumbs up. Like I said, great, just peachy. 
I sit for a moment and think to myself, do I really want to do this? I mean, the last mug that went to Old Man Pierogi with a depressing attitude joined the last circus that came through here and made an act for himself of being shot out of a cannon. He called himself the Great Shell Shot. Hmm, I could see that. I told Danny Morbid where I wanted to go. I also told him, let's try and keep the conversation on an upbeat note, if that wasn't asking too much. Danny said that up stuff was just like yesterday. He came home and three of his goldfish were floating in the tank sideways. His next door neighbor was putting up a TV antenna and got nailed by lightning. Now his hair has a white stripe down the middle. He has to be real careful in the woods. It's mating season, you know. Like I said, when I got in the taxi, oh great, just peachy. The cab dropped me off in front of old man Pierogi's house. I convinced myself that no matter what happens, from this taxi to the front door of old man Pierogi's, I'm going to stay positive, positive. Positive. I got out and handed Danny Morbid a sawbuck through the front passenger window. Danny reached for the dough with his hand all bandaged up. He looked at me and said he and his blunder had issues. I couldn't stare at the bandages. He had two fingers and no thumb on his right hand. He saw me staring and said, oh, that. He was about to get into it when I just removed my arm, turned, and just kept muttering to myself, positive, think positive. Jeesh, no thumbs. Mm-mm. Think positive, positive. stone walkway. It took me to a garden with vines and flowers. Nice place, considering the man I came to see. I entered a clearing, and there he is, bigger than life itself. Intimidating for such a small man. No, make that for such a small old man. I had to get a reality check before I went too far with the, ah, isn't he nice to be an old man stuff. This nice old man ran the city, all of it, anytime, all the time. His smile and gentle demeanor hit a vicious mean streak that was as raw as red meat. When the old man was coming up in the ranks at that side of town, he went through five other guys just like him, one after the other. He was smart about it too, just a little at a time. Now, he has all the time in the world. I was cautious about going up to him. He had a lot of muscle around, and that muscle had what they called soldiers backing them up. I rubbed the top of my shoes on the back leg of my trousers. He caught that out of the corner of his eye, smiled, and walked over to a statue of his mother. At the base of the statue was a small basin filled with water. He dipped his fingers into the basin. Water dripping from his hand raised his hand to his lips, then reached out and touched the lips of his mother's statue. I lowered my head out of respect and said nothing. The old man slowly shuffled his feet 
across a marble patio and went into the house. I stayed. Rickles came out to the patio and motioned me to come in, but stopped me at the entrance of the hall. He pointed to a chair. I sat. I waited for about an hour, quietly. In the entrance of the hall, the walls were covered with portraits. I assumed they were of the pierogi family. Old style portraits, and all of them staring right at me. I almost started a conversation with one, muttering to myself, Hi, how you doing? Nice haircut. Just my luck. Brinkles was standing right behind me. Just my luck. Brinkles got the hold of the back of my chair, spun me around like a carousel, and pointed to a large room with wooden paneling. Wrinkles stretched open two large wooden door room dividers. I walked in. Old man Pierogi was sitting in a large chair at the end of a very large room. A butler approached me and offered me a small glass of wine. I acknowledged the hospitality by standing. I held my glass up as a sign of respect to my host and took a sip. The wine was sour, almost vinegar. I finished the glass and returned it to the butler. The butler said, Mr. Pierogi welcomes James Ballpoint to his home. What business do you have here? On the ride up to this place, I did some thinking. Now, the old man pierogies of this world do nothing for nobody, unless there's something in it for him. So I had my visit as a way of informing the old man that some hacks may be pushing into his business, taking up a space next to Angel's Bar. Angel and the old man go away back. Some sort of personal thing that had nothing to do with business. Now, personal relationships with men like Pierogi don't just pop up. In fact, personal relationships are quiet, close, not to be talked about. I noticed a change in Old Man Pierogi's posture, his eyes, his face. He called over Wrinkles, whispered something to Wrinkles. Wrinkles shook his head with a yes, repeatedly. Wrinkles walked towards me, slowed a bit, pointed to me and snapped his finger and whisked his hand out towards the patio. I complied. I was standing on the patio waiting for some sort of leave when Wrinkles tugged up my sleeve and turned his head in a way that told me, follow. We got into the beat up heat that Wrinkles drives around in and headed for the city. Wrinkles muttered to himself all the way into town kind of like uh, rehearsing for a play or something. He pulled up in front of Two Fingers Tommy's shoeshine stand, got out and sat in one of the chairs. Two Fingers smiled and went to work, giving a shine for the big guy. Wrinkles picked up a newspaper from under his arm, opened it, and started looking at the funnies. As Two-finger Tommy was working. A couple of mugs walked over and stood on either side of him. These hammers were tough looking, all business-like. One of them nudged Two-fingers Tommy with his knee, clearing his throat and was about to say something when 
Wrinkles lowered the paper, bolted it, and stood up. Both of the mugs looked surprised. One of them recognized Wrinkles and said his name. As they backed up off the curb and into the street, I could tell the two were measuring the situation and Wrinkles along with it. Now, Wrinkles doesn't talk much. He doesn't have to. The other shoe black, hiding behind the corner wall of angels, walked across the street and down an alley. The two mugs that tried to shake down Two Fingers Tommy drove away in a fancy car with out-of-state plates. Wrinkles got into his heap drove away and said nothing. I turned to Two Fingers and wanted to say something, but Two Fingers was hiding behind his shoeshine stand, crouched over. I thought to myself, well, things are back to normal. I went into Angel's bar, covered a stool and was about to have my usual when the phone booth door slid open and it was Snitch. He motioned me to come over, looking back and forth practically. Yeah, like I said, things are sure back to normal. Well, folks, that concludes another episode of Jimmy Ballpoint, Private Investigator, brought to you by Sudsy Wudsy, that all-purpose cleaner. Keep your radio dial on this station for next week's Jimmy Ballpoint, Private Investigator. Here, I knows the complete package. <laughs>